Okay. All right, Meredith. Now, I mean, this thing's going to last anywhere between a half hour or 45 minutes, somewhere in there. Okay. Now, remember, this is all about you. We're going to find that. And what I want you to do is take a, you left here in eighth or ninth grade. I did. Uh, ninth grade. Ninth. So you stayed through ninth. I okay. did. I want you to take us, when you left at ninth grade, where you went, all the way, your schools, everything, when you got out of there, what you did, it, it, that, so that people, when they plug into this thing, your former classmates, parents, our parent body, they're going to have an idea about you. So okay. take it away. <laughs> I don't know if I can remember back that far. <laughs> um, but I'll do my best. Let's see. Um, so I, yeah, I graduated from the day school in ninth grade. Um, and then I ended up, I stayed local. Um, I wanted to stay at home with my parents. Um, and I was very attached to them. I lived with my grandmother and my grandfather and both parents. Um, so anyway, so I went to the Palm Beach Lakes um, Community High School. Uh, for my last three years or for my three years of high school. Um, and, um, you know, I enjoyed it there. It was very different than the day school. It was um, it going from a class of 10 people to a class of 600 people and a school of 4,000 um, was a big change, but um, it was good. And it gave me a different kind of experience in uh, America's public, crazy public school system. Um, and let's say I left, I did a lot of the AP classes there. I know like people now, you know, go to magnet programs. We didn't have magnet programs back then. So your sort of option was to do the AP program at one of the local schools. So I did that. And, um, I got in as if, uh, I went to Harvard, um, uh, early acceptance. Um, and I, one of my, uh, other classmates, I had two classmates from the day school at, um, Palm Beach Lakes which was uh, Mary D. Marcellus, who ended up going to Princeton, and uh, Rachel Martin, um, who went to a Florida uh, college. Um, and I'm trying to think if there was anybody else in my class there, but those were the day schoolers I was, I was closest to and stayed closest to. And then um, I went to Harvard and um, I was there for four years. I studied economics. Um, notable moments at Harvard. I actually just had my 20th year um, college reunion, which was a Zoom reunion um, for <laughs> class of 1995. And um, I guess the biggest thing that happened to me there that also dovet doves dovetails with like what Mr. Greco taught me was, um, so in my senior year, I wrote a book called The Annual Report of the USA. And at the time, there wasn't much of an internet <laughs> back then, and nobody really emailed anybody. So you couldn't find this, you couldn't find things online like you can today. And so I compiled kind of a, a, um, a, a basically like a budget for the US. Um, and um, I did sort of like a, about a hundred page book, kind of like a, an annual report for a corporation. But um, this was an annual report for the US, and I put you know, basic statistics like, you know, what's the percentage of, you know, what's the ethnic breakdown of the U.S.? Uh, what's the population growth of the U.S.? Um, how do we spend our money? And um, I, it ended up being kind of a helpful tool, um, you know, for policymakers and lobbyists and things like that to kind of refer to. Um, and so I wrote that my senior year and um it got into the hands of Ross Perot, who was, you know, very active then politically and running for president. Uh, he ran in 92 and 96, I think. And um, they credit he, him for losing the election for uh, someone, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, weirdly, he testified in front of Congress. Well, he was testifying in front of Congress about NATO, which he um, was very vocal about. And he took, he took my book and he kind of waved it around and somebody took a picture. And then it, I, Ross Pro called me at my dorm room and he said, this Ross Pro? And I said, I said, are you sure it's not Dana Carvey from Saturday Night Live? And I didn't say that, but that's what I thought in my head. And um, he he said, no, it's really Ross Perot. And I liked your book and, you know, I want to talk to you. So, you know, that started this um, relationship with him and with um, either pro campaign, honestly. Um, and I, I kind of toured around a little bit with him, uh, for, you know, for his second campaign and actually introduced him at, on his, at his acceptance speech 
um, on that campaign. And he was a real mentor. Um, but anyway, he helped me get that book published um, and, you know, launched a writing career uh, for me that really made a huge difference in my life. And, but I, of course, attribute the original uh, interest in writing to Mr. Greco, who in seventh grade sat with us uh, and marked up our papers with this big red pen. <laughs> but it was great because I remember you sat with us and really and gave us very specific notes about how like what good editing was and you know what is it uh writing is 90 percent editing you know it's just you get the first draft out and then you edit 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 until you fall over and you were a great editor and a great inspiration to get me started so i thank you for that do you honey do you remember in eighth grade because i remember vividly you in the eighth grade the speech yeah. Speech you remember, unit. You remember your yeah. template speech? Yeah. Huh? <laughs> those were <laughs> those were the two, I think, that, you know, most important skills that I learned at the day school that, you know, funneled into my eventual career, which was writing and speaking. And that speak, I wish that speak, I don't know if you've ever written that down. I'm sure you have, but it should be a book or something, or it should be a course that kids can like log on to and take online because it was really an amazing, um, the speak, you called it, is it the speaking unit or you called it the speaker? We did it, the, it was the whole last marking period. You remember yeah. you had uh, two weeks of one minute speeches and notes. Yep. And then we started the three minute, four minute, five, seven, eight, and 10 minute final. Time yeah. And all that. And, we, yeah. and I remember you were a, but you turned out fine. You, you actually, I forget. At one point, you started to enjoy it because you yeah. realized how good you were. You realized well, how good you were. <laughs> it was at that age. It's so terrifying. Some kids are naturals, but I was always terrified of it at the beginning. I think like I still have an ulcer from no, <laughs> but it's terrifying. And um, and then I remember the like all of the instruction. I still remember. Um, you know, the, you know, your, I remember, I still have my notes. It's on, it's written on a yellow legal pad at my house. And it's, I remember, I think number one is know your audience. Um, like number two, become an expert in your topic or number three, you know, do the outline. I just, I remember all of those things. And then like, say what, you, say what you're going to say, say it, say what you said. Like, I remember all those. All those things. little things. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know, have you put it into a, um. I have the, what I did, and I used to remember <clears throat> the first two weeks, I'd spend half the class in giving notes and you'd be writing notes down. Mm -hmm. What I stopped doing after a while, I said, this is a waste of time. I ran off the notes. I made notes. So now when they would come in, I'd pass out all the notes. It's a whole thick thing. There's five different sections, voice, uh, movement, all those things like that, preparing to speech, etc. So I have those. I have those. Can, you, can I, I get can a copy? You want them, yeah. yeah, I want them. You know, there's this um, institute, uh, the Khan Academy. You know, Khan Academy. I feel like that would be a great place for them. Um, and they're. I think they are open to like getting. Anyway, I think it's just the greatest thing ever. Well, you know, the biggest thing about if you remember and. and to this day, people will say, well, to be, what are the marks of a good speaker? Number one, confidence. And I've had kids say, well, yeah, but I don't know what confidence is, I tell them. I have no idea what confidence is. All I can tell you, <clears throat> if you do what I tell you to do in front of the audience, and if you prepare, and if you say things the way I want you to, you could be dying inside. It won't matter because the audience will say, Oh, what confidence. And that's all you need. That's all you need, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the speaking unit was spectacular. Um, What's your yeah. favorite book you remember? Oh, from, from the day school? Yeah. Um, it has to be, for sure, The Once and Future King. Go ahead. Um, I loved that book. That, and and I, I reread it all the time, actually. And I'm also shocked at how how many of my my age group or like people I work with don't know that book. And so I always get to reference it and sound smart. Um, but I just, I thought it was great. You know, it's a story of um, King Arthur and we, there, it comes in four parts and it was really great. It was like a big love story and it was like, you know, a political treatise. <laughs> like it was a big adventure. Sorry. 
Do you remember the Count of Monte Cristo? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> that one was that. I think that's my favorite. That's probably my favorite. Like, I mean, big adventure. That was a great one. And I remember you also met, made us read. I think we could choose Vanity Fair or um, War and Peace. <laughs> Yeah, not everyone. Some of you I had for you. Not everyone. Which, By the way, honey, do you remember your old 75 lines from Cyrano de Bergerac and Julius Caesar? Let's see. You remember those? I remember that lately I toss my hat away, languidly over my arm with all of the cloak that covers my bright array, and out my sword to work with all. <laughs> yeah. Those, those are memes that stayed in the brain. Yeah. <laughs> the things you still remember. It works. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so go oh, ahead. Like where were we? You left. Um, uh, you're with Ross Perot. I was with Ross Perot. Yeah. And then, um, then um, I, right after college, I took a brief, I wouldn't say break, but I took a job at um, Morgan Stanley Investment, the Mor Morgan Stanley's Investment Bank um, to get some practical, I guess, experience under my belt. Um, and while I was there, I was, um, I was still, was that right there? I can't remember. Yeah, when I was there, you know, it didn't, I will say it didn't suit me. I wasn't great at investment banking. I wasn't great at doing those long hours and it wasn't my calling. So I'm just saying it's, you know, if you haven't made a few mistakes, then <laughs> you haven't lived. But anyway, that was not my calling. So when I was there, I, I was really failing and I decided I wanted to get another job as, um, and go back into like public policy and reporting and, um, or starting reporting really. And uh, so I got a job, I rode around and there was no, I wasn't like, a, I didn't apply for a job exactly. I just, I applied, I told, I wrote a letter to CNN and I was like, you don't have a lot of young people on your network. You should have young faces on your network, you know, representing Generation X or something like that. So I ended up selling myself to this guy who was kind of on board with that idea. And I ended up being a reporter there. Um, and I guess the lesson there is if there's not a job out there for you, try to make one up. And <laughs> that's what I did. So, and they bought it. And so they let me, they let me be a reporter there. Um, on Generation X issues. Um, and I was there for a long time, actually. Uh, and I was there, you know, reporting on politics and um, economics. And, um, and, then, and then while I was there, I applied to law school. And um, I, I did both. I kind of was at, I was there at CNN. And then I would, you know, during the day, I would go to law school. Um, and the mornings I would do reporting. Um, and I went to Columbia in New York, so I was able to kind of commute back and forth to CNN's to New York to. office. Yeah. What, off, what law school? Oh, I went to Columbia. Columbia. Oh, that's yeah. right. Okay. So, and that was fun. Um, and I learned a lot. I met Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Her daughter was my first year, one of my first year professors, and she was really, really awesome and really tough. And she brought her mom in and her father and her brother, and they would do wine tastings on campus. And so we would drink wine with Ruth Bader Ginsburg and hear her, you know, just stories. And it was super inspiring and interesting. So that was, I, that's like one of my great memories from law school. Um, and I'm trying to think, what did I do after? Then after law school, I went to, I didn't want to be a lawyer. <laughs> So my mother was like, why did I spend all that? Why did we spend all that money sending you to law school? But um, I want, I still wanted to be a writer and um, I moved out to Los Angeles to try my hand at, um, you know, I think I was still trying to get a job, you know, as a reporter and writing. And I don't know, I was a little lost after law school because I had spent all that time doing something and I wasn't sure why. <laughs> so anyway, I moved like on a whim, I sort of moved out to California and I applied I was wanted to try the movie industry. I love storytelling. Um, and I felt like a lot of what I had done in politics was tell stories about politics. So I wanted to try my hand at, at that. And so I ended up getting a job, um, you know, kind of through the alumni network at Harvard at uh, DreamWorks, um, which had just spun up. Um, it, it, you know, Steven Spielberg had always had this company called Amblin. And then he joined with Jeffrey Katzenberg and David Geffen to form a, you know, this new like mega studio that was going to rival Warner Brothers and all these. And, and that was DreamWorks. And um, so we were, I was on, I was early on in that company and um, I stayed there for a long time. 
Um, and my job, I started out in the story department, which was we read scripts and we did notes um, um, to tell the other executives, you know, is this something we want to buy? Um, or if it's a script that we already own, like how can we make this screenplay better? Um, so I was still kind of using those kind of writing skills. Um, and then I stayed there as a development executive. So I was responsible for like buying um, screenplays and turning them into movies. And I worked on um, Dream, Dream Girls and The Ring, which is a horror movie. And um, my, yeah, my last movie was, um, was Dream Girls. I worked on, what else did I work on? Something called The Last Kiss and um, Just Like Heaven. Anyway, a smattering. And I worked with um, um, Walter Parks and Laurie McDonald, who ran the company for Steven for many, many years. Um, and what else? Um, um, and then <laughs> I sort of decided that like, I, I'm a, I'm a career jumper. I, I jump careers kind of a lot. Um, I decided, sure. yeah, sorry. Um, and then, you know, my parents needed help with their business, which is a real estate. It's like a real estate investment business. Um, my dad was, you know, got ill. And so I quit and I, uh, came home and I helped them run their business for a long time. And then in the background, I would, I started a couple of, I started a nonprofit, which was um, focused on teaching debate actually to kids in, in LA. So we, we ran a debate program for a long time in um, some high schools around here. And we, I, I spun up the annual report again, and we did, we, we, we published the annual report. We published state reports in a similar fashion and did like, I did a, a, a kind of review of state finance, which was really interesting. And actually I saw some of the problems um, that states are, are, are sort of facing with their budget. So that was interesting. And then a couple of years ago, I got anxious to go back to Hollywood. And um, so I, I, a friend uh, introduced me to Kara Sedgwick who's an actress and, you know, she's, she said, um, I want to start a production company. I don't just want to act anymore. I want to direct. And so we um, spun up this company called, it's called Big Swing <laughs> and Big Swing Productions. And so I'm kind of back at least half of my time doing um, film projects. And what I finally landed on after all those kind of uh, paths in different directions was that I really want to, which is what I'm doing now, develop uh, film projects and book projects based on true stories. So um, it sort of marries my love of um, journalism with my love of storytelling. So the project I'm working on now, as an example, is, um, and I love politics and I love science. So like I'm, I try to do projects that have something, have some sort of significance in that area. So the project we're doing now, it's actually kind of interesting because again, it ties back to the day school. So um, Mr. Sarko, um, you know, had applied to be the teacher in space. And I always remember that because we spent that year, you know, researching NASA and learning all about NASA. And of course he didn't get it. Christy McCullough did. And um you know, that always, and then we went out, I remember going out on the field that year, 1986, and watching the Challenger launch and seeing it explode and having our teachers run around and try to explain to us what happened. And Mr. Sarko in particular was really moved. Um, and we were all just, it was horrible. Anyway, so I always remembered that. And, you know, now years later, um, we, I sort of was like, you know, who else was on that flight and what, you know, like I wanted to learn more, just curious, just curiosity. And I had had some relatives who were also in NASA and I had asked them about that. Anyway, long story short, um, four of the people on that flight were part of this class. It was an astronaut class of 1978. And that was the first class NASA hired civilians. So it was the first time they hired non-white military guys into the class so in that class is like Sally Ride, the first woman to fly, um, Judy Resnick, the first Jewish person to fly, El Onizuko, the first Asian American to fly, Guy Bluford, the first African American to fly, you know, Anna Fisher, the first mom to fly. So anyway, in that class was this great group of scientists who did all these amazing things. Anyway, so 
you know, um, my project now is we're writing a book on those astronauts and then we're turning that into a TV series. So that's what takes up almost all of my time right now. Let me ask you this question. Now. Yeah. You like storytelling. Have you tried any fiction of your own? Um, <laughs> yes, not particularly successfully. I mean, I have done um, narrative nonfiction. So I did, um, I wrote the pilot for the TV series that I'm talking about. I don't know that it came out that well. <laughs> so we may, we may get somebody else to rewrite me. Um, and I did try, I have tried a couple of like, I think I tried a book about my, the, I tried to like write a fictionalized book about, um, you know, a, like a, um, a, an older couple dealing with a murder that, you know, happened in their youth or something like that. But I haven't like really nailed it yet. I don't know that it's in me. Um, I'm definitely more geared towards narrative nonfiction, I think. Well, let me just say this for what it's worth. I'll yeah. Now you're, you'd have to be 47. For a young, for a fiction writer, you're young yet. Okay. You're young yet. <laughs> yeah, I'll take it. You're young yet. Yeah. So don't, don't give up on it. I won't. Don't give up on it because you yeah. know, you, there's a lot. Just think back, honey, what, what the little novel you could write about Palm Beach Day School. Fiction. Interweaving that with real <laughs> things that have happened here. Believe me. Yeah. Believe me. So don't give up on it. Yeah. When you say you like telling stories, keep that in mind. All right. Mind. I know that's true. Palm Beach has is a rich, a rich ground for, yeah. for things that have interesting things that have happened. <laughs> I'm still I'm still working on it. I don't know if I'll ever finish it because it's been so long and everything. But I'm doing one on um, the night they stole Palm Beach, and it's about a gang of thieves who come in in the. 50s, the early 50s, I need to put it there for certain reasons. And there are characters from town, the boy who grew up in Palm Beach, got sent to prison, met the gang, the, the, the big, the, anyway, they decide they're going to make the biggest robbery of all times. And how they do it is they get a policeman in the police department. And on one night, they bring all the police in on from the cars and lock them up. And then they go out and rook, steal everything from the banks. They get the banks open. They get into all the jewelry stores, the art things. It's a huge multi-million thing. But anyway, the story, that's how. <laughs> that's so fun. I love that. You like it? You want to take it with me? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, let's do it. But, uh, but it's... Uh, but I put some things in it too that, you know, I put some, something you, you got to be careful. I, I tried to put some philosophy in there, you know, about the two characters, one who does something that is so unreal that you say, well, that can't happen because he's not built that way, but yet it did happen. And anyway, and I got, got a little too, so I'm working on, it. I'll probably croak before it's finished, but that's no. okay. If I do, you have the idea where you take it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it's anything like your, I, are we call it's it is your first book, No Tears for Wimbledon. Yeah, No Tears to Wim. How about that? Yeah, I don't think it's the best tennis book I ever read. Anyway, but that's my. Yeah. Own no, book. it's great. It's great. Uh, so okay, honey. So, so that's where you are now. Mm -hmm. You're back here in town, of course, taking care of your family and everything. Mm -hmm. Every, everyone is. How's your mom? She's okay. She okay. Yeah. Yeah, she's okay. That's good. That's good. Your kids, the kids fine. Everybody's okay. They're so happy to be here. We were How in California. They? How old are they? Um, I've got a six-year-old and two five-year-olds. Six and two fives. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And where are they going to school now? Where they're they're on they're in um, remote school at uh, Sequoia. I mean, we live in California usually, um, and they go to a school called Sequoia. Uh -huh. which is a great school and they're online right now, but yeah. they don't have any in-person, um, you know, contact or anything. Okay. Okay. Now what I'd like you to do is some remembrance of things past, just off the top of your head. Some things that you want to recall about your, you were here from what years? 
Um, second grade to ninth grade. Second, two through nine, two through mm -hmm. nine. Some, some things you remember that some memes that have stuck in there. Mm -hmm. in, are, you, are you familiar at all with mimetic theory? Mm -hmm. Are you, are you, honey? A little bit. I mean, I think it's like um, phrases or turns of phrase that stick with you or. Well, you if, you, if you have nothing, sometimes if you have nothing to do and you're looking to get a book, get a book called The Meme Machine. Okay. Susan Blackmore. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. Her theory, of course, is genes used to be the dominating thing because they want, all they want to do is replicate. That's all a gene's interested in. Mm -hmm. But she says in the last how many hundreds or thousands of years, though, since speech has come in, memes also are influencing, influencing us in the mimetic things, how they work. Uh, for example, da-da-da-da, the first four notes of Beethoven's thing, that's a meme. And it's planted in people's brains so that it, and it has its own thing. Of course, you're going to have to get in. One, oh, but it, it would be so interesting. You'll find it reading it. And of yeah. course, again, this Susan Blackmore is taught, taught at Oxford. And she's at Oxford. Of course, she's going to end up telling you that last chapter um, that I haven't decided yet. I'm still working on it, <laughs> if I accept it or not. That uh, you have no choice whether you're going to write that fiction or not, because determinism is going to, you have no free will. It's all an illusion. All your actions are decided by your genes and your past reinforcement schedules as far as et cetera, et cetera. That's great. I'll read it, definitely. You'll, you'll find it fascinating. You'll find it fascinating. Yeah. You know, uh, um, so, so that was that was it. Um, while you were here, mm -hmm. dynamics, and you might also, as far as writing something, writing about the dynamics of Palm Beach. <laughs> it's a, I mean, it's a fascinating. It's a fascinating town. I feel lucky that you know whatever relatives I had decided to settle in West Palm and Palm Beach, and I feel lucky that I think my mom. My mom didn't go to Palm, she went to Twin Lakes. She went to the public school system. And she said, I used to have to debate against the Palm Beach Day School. I think it was called something else back then. And she said, I just swore that like, if I ever had any children, they would go to the Palm Beach Day School because they were so well prepared and I always got beaten <laughs> by them. So it was Twin Lakes when she went there. It when was for her even earlier, it was actually called Palm Beach Lakes High School. At least because when my daughter and Lisa, my son and daughter were there, it was Twin Lakes High School. Yeah. Twin Lakes High School. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, I mean, it was, I mean, it was great. I mean, I have, yeah, I have so many fond memories um, from the day school. And they're, I, because they're early memories, I think they really stick with you, you know. Um, I mean, from your class, from um, Mr. Skinner's class <laughs> in Latin. Yeah, he had some good turns of phrase. I was like when picking daisies, declining adjective, I don't know, declining verbs and conjugating, you know, you got to first get hold of the stem and like he had the, you know, and um, I, yeah, there's so many things I remember. It was Mrs. Close was here, wasn't she? Mrs. Close, was, Mrs. Bayless. Well, Mrs. Oh, Bayless. Yeah. Bayless. <laughs> no, and I really loved, I mean, I really loved, I didn't talk about it really, but I really loved math a lot. And um you know, when I got to college, I wasn't able to, like, I just, I didn't have the kind of brain that could keep up with like calculus and like, like higher math. But what I did love is statistics. And I really connected to statistics and econ I did economics and I loved doing, and I still love that kind of math. I mean, I love, um, you know, running models and thinking about the way people present information and statistics and stuff. And that was an important part of my job early on. Did you get into any in economics, especially? I'm more, did you get in in the work in game theory? Yep. Game theory. Did you ever run across Prisoner's Dilemma? Yep. You did. Yep. Well, you know, this is big in genetic. What do you call and uh, a very famous uh, a geneticist. His name is uh, Richard Dawkins. You ever heard of Richard Dawkins? Mm -hmm. He's he wrote a he, he wrote the uh, 
The Selfish Gene. Have you mm -hmm. ever read that? I have read, I think I skimmed it. I'll be honest, I don't think I read the whole book. Okay, it's very yeah. common. I, I got into it in this, uh, in, in, in this COVID thing, honey. Been home alone and, uh, and, I, and I picked up some of these this books and I, so I got into the, when I, uh, Darwin, Darwinian theory, natural selection, which mm -hmm. led to all this. And I was never big in science. I was never big. I, I got through it, but I never, it was never fascinated me, math or science. It was, mm -hmm. I always figured that was for the real smart kids. I could do it. I could go in English where you could write and get, get away with anything there. So I'd be reading this Dawkins, the, the uh, Selfish Gene and the, mem the book on memetics. And the self I couldn't understand things. So I'd call my son-in-law, Mr. Wagner. And yes. Explain, what do you mean? What's a phenotype? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm plowing through that, and at least that's keeping me interested. That's exciting. I still haven't made up my, here I am, I'm 88. As I, I, I have two students. I already had them interviewed. Um, Kotzen, that name familiar to you, Kotzen? I think so, but I can't remember exactly. Um, uh, Christian Miller. Oh, yeah. Okay, Christian is a philosophy in, uh, PhD at Wake Forest. That's and awesome. Kotzen is a philosophy PhD at North Carolina. That's great. I interviewed both of those. And I'm going back and forth on this Darwinian thing and all this. And, and they've really been, and by the way, they both have their tenure, which is great, which is great. Awesome. But we, we're going, and they're laughing at me about it. I tell them, here I am, I'm, I'm 88 years old, and I should be you know, getting ready wherever I'm going, but I still haven't figured it out. Do I believe in free will or not? I still haven't made up my mind. <laughs> So you have good. a few more years to think about it, honey. Okay, good. I know. <laughs> I have to get back into reading some more philosophy and expanding my mind a little bit. That sounds like fun, actually. Oh, yeah. I, I'll, I'll, when I take some course, I remember one philosophy instructor told me, he was so funny, we're talking about all the different ideas, and he said, at the end, I remember it was the end of the lecture, too, and I can still remember, isn't it something? This is in college, honey. These memes, these memes really stick. Mm-hmm. Once you get it, they, they, they stick. And I remember he said, keep one thing in mind, people. There never was philosopher could bear a toothache patiently. <laughs> I like that. I like I, that. I still remember. And I, when I told Christian and what do you call, they laughed. And then, That's right. That's hilarious. <laughs> According to them, the field of philosophy, so divided. He mm -hmm. said, half the people don't believe in determinism. The other half do. Uh, a few years ago, it came out I, I, uh, where they said the whole theory of determinism breaks down in subatomic physics. That's, I, 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 I buy that. You, it breaks down. In, now, my question was immediately, well, wait, how can you extrapolate something in subatomic physics to human behavior? Yeah. That? See, I couldn't figure that out. I but love it breaks down. <laughs> yeah, I love the idea that the, the idea, and I don't think any, I, I, because I, I come at it from like a movie point of view, like I don't think anybody's told this story successfully yet, but like that anything that can happen has and will, you know, there's a, that we live in probabilities as opposed to, the, you know, finite outcomes. And so, you know, this idea that there's multiple universes. I like to think that like somewhere out there, there's like, I have a universe in which I am a fiction writer and maybe I'm a this and you know, like you are. And, and so I like to think in that way, um, you know, that there's multiple universes where multiple things can happen. And well, maybe- it's fascinating. I find it fascinating. Uh, yeah. I re again, I remember from an early philosophy course I took in college. Mm -hmm. Professor said, remember, he, the, on the first day, the first day, he said, begin in doubt and end in certainty. You begin in doubt and you end in certainty. But I also said, I find the other one works too. Begin in certainty and you end in doubt. That's yeah. right. <laughs> I like that better. I like <laughs> yeah, The older you get, the less you know. So anyway, so Meredith, there we are, honey. So yeah. 
I, uh, as I said, um, think about if you like to tell stories when you, and you've said that a few times, I know, mm -hmm. tell stories. You probably have some great stories you could tell. And as I said, you know, as far as a fiction writer, you're 47, you're young, you're just, I mean, you're a baby. Just you're, just a, you're a baby, okay? All right, well, thank you. Don't forget that. 